So I actually was the one that called dibs on going last. I'm thinking that was a mistake <laughs> right about now. Uh, but you know, I tend to play so much when the auto and oil spaces and I so rarely get to have the last word that it was just too tempting. Uh, but it was sort of reminded to us earlier that we are all that stands between you and a party. So I talk faster than they do. Uh, I wear a lot of hats. Uh, Plug in America, I actually no longer run, but I did co-found it. It remains a very sort of proud accomplishment. I do run another smaller foundation that none of you have heard of by design. Uh, called the Lightning Rod Foundation. So I do a lot of advocacy work. Uh, someone, you know, about six months ago at another conference, I kind of said, you know, what do you do? And uh, kind of at a loss and, and not very eloquent half the time, I said, well, I'm kind of the grout between the stakeholder tiles. And, and that is kind of how I think about what we run around and do. Because we do have lots of people with very dedicated interests and we spend a lot of time interpreting between them. So primarily we work with three specific constituent groups. Uh, first is automakers, big and small. For the longest time, it was sort of convincing them that people kind of wanted these cars and this technology and this is really a space they ought to be playing in. Now that they're all getting back into it, it tends to be more, uh, more how to go about it, more how to help them avoid some of the skin knees that we sort of have already been there, done that in the past. Um, someone mentioned to me here that they sort of took issue with the fact that we declared the batteries as the only non-guilty party in, in who killed the electric car. Uh, but really, the most popular batteries we had on the EV programs were lead acid. And that was kind of a really, un, it was an unexpected but a very interesting takeaway because what we found out was you didn't have to have the perfect car that would go 300 miles and refuel in five minutes and do all of those things. They just had to you know, get you through your normal day and recharging ability had to be available. That was a really interesting lesson for the automakers and now we have a half a dozen major companies working on pure electric cars and all of them are in the 100 mile range. They're no longer trying to build the big cars anymore. Uh, and then there certainly are lots of little companies that are trying to be a part of this and some interesting marriages that are, that are being talked about and potentially taking place in partnerships and those sorts of things. So we do some matchmaking too here and there. Uh, we work a lot with policymakers. Not nearly as much as some of you here, and obviously I come from the side of the country who doesn't, who doesn't respect any uh, politician who's not Martin Sheen, I think. Um, <laughs> I, I think some folks in LA still believe we can elect a president by giving him enough awards. But nevertheless, there is a role for policy, and we have learned that very much in this space, and historically California has led a lot of the, the sort of plug-in related policy. Not so much anymore. I mean, I think finally, after a lot of years of doing this, we have gotten not only sort of national and federal involvement, but we have a lot of other states wanting to give California a run for their money, which I really like. <laughs> so I spend time talking to, you know, Florida and Indiana and, and, you know, places that you would not expect would want to lead in this space, and all of a sudden we have a little bit of horse race. And then finally, of course, we work a lot with consumers. And it is really all about them. And for years, it has been a grassroots movement and very consumer driven and people calling and writing guys like Bob Lutz saying, I want my car. I want to support domestic companies, but I want my plug-in car. You have to do better. And as a grassroots person, I really love that. I love that it's being led and that the consumers are out in front of policymakers and automakers. I also think that's a little bit of a pathetic statement about the other two, <laughs> but I hope they take that as a challenge. Uh, but nevertheless, there's certainly a long way to go between concept and showroom, and we kind of feel like this is going really fast because all of a sudden we have all these automakers that are showing plug-in cars, and the reality is you go, to, you know, to the flyover states, and I do a lot of that. And first thing I I hear after people see the film is I didn't know there was such a thing as a plug-in car, and that really gets to the heart of a lot of the problem because automakers stand back and they say, hey, we want to build cars, people want to buy buy them millions, and they're not asking for plug-in cars, you know, in that volume. Therefore, they must not want them. We say, mm, that's great, but they can't ask for what they don't know is possible. It is akin to expecting someone to look at their Walkman and say, I wish this were the size of a deck of cards and I could watch TV on it. You know, we never would have thought to ask for iPods, but gosh, we've sure gotten used to them once they came around. And so we have a similar challenge with consumers, and we spend a lot of time educating them, getting them to want them, and also managing their expectations. It's been noted now that we have this sort of backup of consumer demand, which is great and sort of deja vu but that we really expect supply will be limited for a number of years and the, the automakers are not prepared to make as many as people are willing to buy. And so there's some managing of that expectation and sort of walking the line between enthusiasm and vaporware and getting people excited even though we won't have cars for a couple years and those sorts of challenges as well. And then lastly, I, think, I thought I'd touch on sort of an intriguing space since Sven's here too and that's the role of venture. 
of the VC community. And we've seen recently the only people wanting to spend money in this space are the venture capitalists. And they have enabled, I think, a lot of really kind of catalytic companies, but also ideas. I mean, Sven got up and talked about Better Place. Uh, Vantage Point is an investor in, in it and also Tesla. There's another venture firm that's backed uh, Fisker and Think, so we have those four companies. And then recently Warren Buffett just invested $230 million in a Chinese company called BYD. So all of a sudden, these five deals have brought a lot of attention to this space. And they really enabled looking at some new business models. You know, can we figure out how to reduce the cost of cars up front so people can own them? Is the cell phone model the right model? And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if any one of these are the right ones, but they get people talking and they get people excited. And, you know, Tesla's been very well known for a couple of years now. And no question, that is a wicked fun car to drive. I mean, it is zero to 60 in four seconds and very sexy. <laughs> but the cool thing about Tesla for me is actually not the car. And, and as a gearhead, that's kind of weird for me to say. But when you go back to Detroit, all of the engineers at GM know that there are 6,831 cells in a Tesla. Now they'll tell you all day long that a company with Tesla's size can't make Detroit do anything and yet every one of them is paying attention. And what really that begs the question of is if a company like Tesla can come out and unveil a $100,000 car that's never going to be in my driveway anytime soon, two years ago, have people pay all money up front for a car and a company that no one's ever heard of and you won't see for that long, what could GM do or Toyota do if they really put their minds to it? And I think people really started thinking differently when the little guys started coming out saying, maybe it doesn't happen in Michigan, maybe it happens in Silicon Valley, maybe it happens with a new model. And so that's what we spend our time running around doing, is, is a lot of that, trying to get people to think differently, managing that thinking and those expectations, and lots of interpreting between all those sites. And we do a little bit more on the communications front. We believe very, fr very strongly in the meet people where they are. So obviously we made that first little film, we really did think we'd burn copies for our parents and move on with our lives been as surprised as Bill or anybody else that anybody is still watching it and that we're still running around doing screenings. And so we are making another one. And it is titled Revenge of the Electric Car. Uh, <laughs> we are chronicling all of the efforts to bring them back by big automakers, small automakers, more, much more the human interest story. And we are counting on all of you to make sure that film gets finished by ensuring we have content. Thanks. Thank you.